Mitochondrial barcodes. There's a press article that outlines the story that comes behind mitochondrial barcodes. And um, it's found in a number of different places. I'm quoting the what I think is the most authoritative place I can find, which is physics.org. There's another place that you will see in a little while. Um, I think that outlines the whole article, uh, but uh, has a comment that uh, I wish to draw to your attention. Uh, but for now, we're just going to look at the uh, uh, at the press release, and the reason why is not so much that um, uh, that it's there. Uh, and we could go to the, the original source, it is because in the press release, the people who um, did the research will say things that you don't say in the uh, article itself. The underlying research is there. But this gives you kind of how they put it together, what they think about it, in ways that you won't get from the article itself. Anyway, the article is by Marlo Hood, and it starts out for this planet 7.6 billion people, 500 million house sparrows, or 100,000 sandpipers. Genetic diversity is about the same. Mark Stuckel from the university, I'm sure that should read, says Mark Stuckel from the Rockefeller University in New York. Oh, I guess it is, he told AFP. Okay, who would have suspected that a handheld genetic test used to unmask sushi bars pawning off tilapia for tuna, that is you can tell them by their mitochondrial barcode that that's not tuna, um, could deliver deep insights into evolution, including how new species emerge. And who would have thought to trawl through five million of these gene snapshots called DNA barcodes, collected from 100,000 animals, species, by hundreds of researchers around the world and deposited in the US government-run GenBank database. That's right, if you have a computer, you can do this at home. That would be Mark Stuckel from the Rockefeller Uni University in New York and David Thaler at the University of Basel in Switzerland, who together published findings last week sure to jostle, if not overturn, more than one settled idea about how evolution unfolds. Just as a little aside, which they don't say here, these people have collaborated together for several other publications. This is not a strange new field for them. It is textbook biology, for example, that species with large, far-flung populations, think ants, ants, rats, humans, will become more genetically diverse over time. But is that true? The answer is no, said Stuckel, lead author of the study published in the Journal of Human Evolution. For the planet, 7.6 billion people, 500 million house bears, or 100,000 sandpipers, genetic diversity is about the same, he told AFP. The uh, study's most startling result, perhaps, is that nine out of 10 species on Earth today, including humans, came into being 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. What about the other 10? Well, some of them are more recent. I don't know, it'd be interesting to see how many uh, are less recent. This conclusion is very surprising and I fought against it as hard as I could, Thaler told AFP. What? I fought against it as hard as I could. Apparently he doesn't like this conclusion. 
the, the reaction, that reaction is understandable. How does one explain the fact that 90% of animal life, genetically speaking, is roughly the same age? We'll come back to that, uh, I hope. If I don't, why uh, remind me? Was there some cat catastrophic event 200,000 years ago that ne nearly wiped the slate clean? Yeah. Hmm, simpler, cheaper. To understand the answer, one has to understand the DNA barcoding. Animals have two kinds of DNA. The one that we're most familiar with, nuclear DNA, is passed down in most animals by male and female parents and it contains the genetic blueprint for each individual. In analyzing DNA PAR codes across 100,000 species, researchers found a telltale sign showing that almost all the animals emerged about the same time as humans. The genomic the, pardon me, the genome made up of DNA is constructed with four types of molecules arranged in pairs. In humans, there are about three billion of these pairs grouped into about 200,000 genes. But all animals also have, and all plants, by the way, have D and DNA in their mitochondria, which are tiny, the tiny structures inside each cell that convert energy from food into a form the cells can use. Mitochondria contain 37 genes, and one of them, known as COI, or CO1 actually, is used to uh, do DNA barcoding. Unlike the genes in nuclear DNA, which can differ greatly from species to species, all animals have the same set of mitochondrial DNA, providing a common basis for comparison. Mitochondrial DNA is also a lot simpler and cheaper to isolate. Around 2002, Canadian molecular biologist Paul Hebert, who coined the term DNA barcode, figured out a way to identify species by analyzing the COI or CO1 gene. Um, the mitochondrial sequence has proved perfect for this all animal approach because it has just the right balance of two conflicting properties, says Thaler. Neutral mutations. On the one hand, the CO1 gene sequence is simpler across all animals, making it easier to pick out and compare. On the other hand, these mitochondrial snippets are different enough to be able to distinguish between each species. It coincides almost perfectly with species designations made by specialist experts in each animal domain, Thaler said. In analyzing the barcodes across 100,000 species, the researchers found a telltale sign showing that almost all the animals emerged about the same time as humans. What they, what they saw was a lack of variation in so-called neutral mutations, which are the slight changes in DNA across generations that neither help nor hurt an individual's chance of survival. In other words, they were irrelevant in terms of the natural and sexual drivers of evolution. That is, not subject to natural or sexual selection. A new DNA study found that nine out of 10 species on Earth today, including humans, came into being 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. How similar or not these neutral mutations are to each other is like tree rings. They reveal the approximate age of a species. Which brings us back to our question, why did the overwhelming majority of species in existence today emerge at about the same time? Notice they keep coming back to this theme, because this is the one that puzzles them. Darwin perplexed. Environmental trauma is one possibility, explained Jesse A. Ausubel, director of the Program for Human Environment at the Rockefeller University. This is now no longer under um, Stuckel and, and Thaler's control. Viruses, ice ages, successful new competitors, loss of prey, all of these may cause periods when the population of an animal drops sharply, he told AFP commenting on the study. In these periods, it is easier for genetic innovation to sweep the population and contribute to the emergence of a new species. But the last true mass extinction event was 65.5 million years ago when a likely asteroid strike wiped out land-based dinosaurs and half of all species on Earth. This means a population bottleneck is only a partial explanation at best. See, be nice to explain this with a catastrophe, but there have been no catastrophes in the past 65 million years. The simplest ex interpretation is that life is always evolving, said Stuckel. It is more likely that at all times in evolution, the animals alive at that point arose relatively recently. 
In this view, a species only lasts a certain amount of time before it either evolves into something new or goes extinct. And yet, another unexpected finding from the study, species have very clear genetic boundaries and there's nothing much in between. If individuals are stars and species are galaxies, said Thaler, they are compact clusters in the vastness of empty sequence space. The absence of in-between species is something that also perplexed Darwin, he said. End. Satisfying? Interesting, at least. Now, if I can summarize this, the mitochondrial sequence for cytochrome oxidase 1 has been determined multiple times for multiple species. There's very little interspecies variation. The calculations are that it could have arisen in 100,000 to 200,000 years in 90% of the species studied. And remember that, you know, if it's a little bit more than that, a little bit less than that, well, if it's less than that, it could still fit, whatever. Uh, something had a, a problem somewhat less than 100,000 years ago. And if it's more than that, well, there's a certain statistical variation in how much mitochondrial changes there are. And so you kind of expect there to be a spread. One, uh, one uh, source that I read uh, said something of the order of 51 to 400,000 gives the 95% confidence limits for a single measurement. So 100 to 200,000, yeah, that's pretty good actually for 90%. Um, there's considerable interspecies variation, which is interesting too. Now, some kind of natural disaster would be a good explanation for this phenomenon. But, you know, there hasn't been any natural disasters in the last 65 million years. Therefore, we must be looking at a constant evolution which routinely erases any divisions over some 100,000 to 200,000 years old. Even in populations that are spread all over the world like rats, like ants, just something goes through every 200,000 years, cleans everything out, and uh, starts a new uh, mitochondria. <laughs> um, what can I say? Okay, well, does the paper support that? There is, the paper is available online if you know where to look. Um, Stuckel and Thaler, why should mitochondria define species in human evolution? To read the abstract so you get an idea of where the, the overview of it. And then what I'm going to do, there's something called the precis, P-R-E-C-I-S, which looks like a summary of the points that are going to be made. And many of them are relatively uncontroversial. And, um, and so I will uh, not support them. Other ones are either controversial or important or both, and I will quote from the paper to support those. Here's the abstract. More than a decade of DNA barcoding encompassing f about 5 million specimens covering 100,000 animal species supports the generalization that mitochondrial DNA clusters largely overlap with species as defined by domain experts. Species that we think are species, sure enough, they're species most of the time. Um, like 90 plus percent, 94 percent of the time in birds, I think. <clears throat> Most barcode clustering reflects synonymous substitutions. What evolutionary mechanisms account for synonymous clusters being largely coincident with species? The answer depends on whether variants are phenotypically neutral. To the degree that variants are selectable, purifying selection limits variation within species, and neighboring species may have distinct adaptive peaks. Phenotypically neutral variants are only subject to demographic processes, drift, lineage sorting, genetic hitchhiking, and bottlenecks. The evolution of modern humans has been studied from several disciplines with detail unique among animal species. You could do this with anything, just this is the most convenient. Mitochondrial barcodes provide a commensurable way to compare modern humans to other animal species. Barcode variations in the modern human population is quantitatively, quantitatively similar to that within other animal species. 
Several convergent lines of evidence show that mitochondrial diversity in modern humans follows from the sequence uniformity followed by the accumulation of largely neutral diversity during a population expansion that began approximately 100,000 years ago. A straightforward hypothesis, by the way, did you notice that it was uh, moved down from 200 to 100,000? This a straightforward hypothesis is that the ex extant populations of almost all animal species have arrived at a similar result consequent to a similar process of expansion from mitochondrial uniformity within the last one to several hundred thousand years. And again, remember, the mitochondrial clock is not, uh, it gives you, you know, an order, probably two orders of two range maybe three orders of two. Now, here is what they call the precis. Number one, mitochondrial cytochrome oxidase subunit one DNA barcodes, that's why I said it's CO1 instead of COI, which would be your natural way of saying it, often shortened to DNA barcodes or barcodes in this article, began as an aid to animal species identification and made no claims of contributing to evolutionary theory. Now I'm going to back up again because for some of you this is still Greek. The mitochondrial genome um, has several pieces in it um, and the one that I want to bring, bring to your attention is cyclooxygenase 1. That is where the mitochondrial barcode is found. What they do is they have primers that will pick up the one in front of it um, and then allow you to duplicate that section again and again and again. And once you do that, you can feed this whole sequence, this whole bunch of sequences that are the supposedly the same. Well, they are really into a machine and that machine will cut off uh, 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 DNA uh, uh, bases one at a time and run it through a machine that scans it automatically. And so this, this whole thing can be done for, well, I wouldn't say pennies, but, but very cheaply so you can do anybody's DNA barcode you want, any plant's DNA barcode, and if you're suspicious of tuna uh, in the sushi bar actually being a different fish, you can pull out a little bit of that stuff and you can put it through this machine and you can come up with the idea, yes, this is really tuna, and go over this one and no, this is not really tuna, they're using a different fish. That's right. Well, to continue with that uh, point one in the precis, uh, five million DNA barcodes later, the consistent and commensurable pattern they present throughout the animal kingdom is one of the most general in biology. In well-studied groups, the majority of bar DNA barcodes clusters agree with domain experts' judgment of distinct species. And where they disagree, they're usually closely related species. History of CO1 barcoding. DNA barcoding was, uh, I am supporting this one with um, a little more detail now. DNA barcoding was first proposed as a tool for practical taxonomy and to democratize actionable biological knowledge. You can test anything you want. Um, at its origin, DNA barcoding made no claim of contributing to evolutionary theory. But I thought nothing in biology made sense except in the light of evolution. Um, previous work bode well for mitochondrial genomes being reliably similar within animal species, yet in many cases distinct among neighbor species. Almost all. We're going to see a few examples where it isn't. The particular mitochondrial sequence that has become most widely used, the 648 base pair segment of the gene encoding mitochondrial cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1, 
reached a tipping point because widely available reliable primers and methods useful for both vertebrates and invertebrates were adopted by a critical mass of the community. In other words, everybody started doing it and pretty soon that meant that if you had any, any animal, you wanted to test it for that. Um, now, keep that 648 number in mind because when they say 1%, they mean uh, 6.48 or six and a half. One percent is actually either six or seven depending on uh, different bases. When they get down to one-tenth of a percent, they mean that there's only one barcode different. A one base different in the entire barcode, right? Okay, so that will help you to translate from barcode percent to actual numbers of bases. Skeptics of COI uh, one barcoding raised a number of objections about its power and or generality as a single simple metric applica applicable to the entire animal kingdom, including and have like 13 or 14 different objections that could be raised. And uh, I'm not gonna go through them all because the current field of uh, CO1 barcodes is no longer fragile, but neither is it complete. As of late 2016, there were close to 5 million CO1 barcodes between the GenBank and BOLD databases. Yeah, and that was anybody who has the right codes can get into these, these databanks and download it and run your own programs on it. Objections can now be seen in the cumulative light of these data and more than a decade's experience. There is no longer any doubt that DNA barcodes are useful and practical. In the great majority of cases, CO1 barcodes yield a close approximation of what specialists come up with after a lot of study. Birds are one of the best characterized of all animal groups and CO1 barcode clusters have been tabulated as agreeing with the expert taxonomy for 94% of species. Pretty impressive. Okay, these are some figures and you can see how much difference you make. Remember this 1% is like six or seven, right? So most of them are like in the zero to one, maybe two. By the time you get out to six or seven percent, you've got like 90 whatever percent. It's also interesting that it doesn't matter how many species you have. The, the R uh, squared for this line is basically zero. That means the line is flat. That means that it doesn't really matter whether you're dealing with a species that we've, that we've done two barcodes or 20 barcodes or 200 barcodes. Well, two barcodes will give you a bigger scatter, but, uh, but the average is gonna be the same. This is a real phenomenon. And that's for birds, that's for fish, that's for moths, doesn't matter. Here's a, uh, here's a, let's see if I can do that again now. Yeah, we have the birds here. Uh, this one happens, Turtis is the genus of robins for what it's worth. And you can see that the species are all separated from each other. Pretty nicely actually. Now, there are some times when two species have the, almost the exact same range. That's what you see, these double lines here and the double lines here. So that's one of the exceptions, where two species basically have the exact same uh, original uh, uh, mitochondrial sequence there. But, you know, it's kind of interesting that the species themselves are very, very low. Remember, this is like zero to one. This is like zero to one. This is like zero to two, zero to three. These things are all like, uh, the, and those, that's a range, by the way, between species. 
there's like, what, two to four diff different. You can tell what species it belongs to. It's really impressive. Intergression events in the more distant past and those involving only part of a species produce more complex patterns as illustrated by Ursus bears, figure three, which we'll look at in just a minute. Based on nuclear and mitochondrial genome analysis, polar bears hybridized with ABC Island brown bears, in case you're wondering where in the world ABC Island is, it's three islands that have uh, initials of A, B, and C. Uh, I think one, A is Admiralty Island, just off of the coast of Juneau, Alaska. Okay. Um, about 50,000 years ago, that is about half of what it used to be, with introgressive replacement of ABC Arctis mitogenomes by Maritimus mitogenomes. So what it looks like is a polar bear wandered down there, started having babies, and uh, her babies took over the island. Maybe it didn't have too many bears to begin with. Maybe her, her babies were better fighters. I don't know. But somehow, um, uh, those ones are polar bears uh, in their mitochondria. Okay. Um, here's, here's figure three, and you'll notice that it's 0%. That is, inside the maritimus, which is the polar bear, and inside of the, I've forgotten what the other one is, there's no variation. There's very little variation. There's a little variation in, uh, uh, see, Maritimus in the, I uh, say Arctos. I don't know why, okay. Um, you can see there's a little variation between them, but not very much. Uh, this is probably all one species to begin with. You can see that most of these, if you look at them carefully, there's almost no variation in the mitochondria in, inside the species. Within the species, it's zero. Now here, within the species, is quite a bit, but between the species, there's a lot of range. Most of those aren't bears. Most of those are actually invertebrates, if you looked at them. Uh, the tight clustering of barcodes within species and unfilled sequence space among them are key facts of animal life that evolutionary theory must explain. This is point two in our precis. Many aspects of speciation are complex. Barcodes are unique in being quantifiably commensurate across all animal species and almost always yielding the same simple, single simple answer. Now I'm going to give you some background on that because I think it's useful. The pattern of DNA barcode variance is the central fact of animal life that needs to be explained by evolutionary theory. In the structure of scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn, these people know their philosophy of science, makes the point that every scientific model takes certain facts of nature experimental results as key ones it has to explain. We take the clustering structure of CO1 barcodes small variants within species and often but not always sequence gaps among nearly nearest neighbor species as the primary fact that a model of evolution and speciation must explain. The pattern of life seen in barcodes is a commensurate whole made from thousands of individual studies that together yield a generalization. The clustering of barcodes has two equally important features. The variance within clusters is low number one, and number two, the species gap among clusters is empty. That is, intermediates are not found. Wow. They grade insensibly into each other. Beyond the qualitative descriptor low for the variance within species, there's a quantitative statement. The average pairwise difference among individuals, average pairwise in APD, equivalent to population genetics parameter pi. So they have, there's an all theory on this, and they, and what they're doing here fits nicely, or at least uh, reasonably, into the theory that, that of population genetics within animal species is between 0.0%, which is no difference, 
and 0.5%, which is what, three difference? Three basis difference. The most data av are, av are available for modern humans who have an APD of 0.1% calculated in the same way as for other animals. One B DNA uh, base difference. See figure two in 34 and figure seven in this paper. The agreement of barcodes and domain experts implies that explaining the origin of the pattern of DNA barcodes would be in large part explaining the origin of species. You want to explain the origin of species? If you can explain the barcodes, you're there. Understanding the mechanism by which the near universal pattern of DNA barcodes comes about would be tantamount to understanding the mechanism of speciation. How's that for a definitive statement? The clustering pattern of life was elegantly articulated by Dobhansky, he of the nothing in uh, biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. In his 1937 book, Genetics and the Origin of Species, from which an extensive quote is merited, and I think it's merited to be repeated here. Only, throughout, only through DNA barcodes can the same metric be used so that the feeling it must be right can now be given a single quantitative meaning across the entire animal kingdom. If we assemble as many individuals living at a given time as we can, we notice that the observed variation does not form a single probability distribution or any other kind of continuous distribution. Instead, a multitude of separate discrete distributions are found. In other words, the living world is not a single array of individuals in which any two variants are connected by unbroken series of intergrades, but an array of more or less distinctly separate arrays, intermediates between which are absent or at least rare. This is an observation of Dubhansky in 1937 and it's just being borne out by genetics. You've heard it grades insensibly. It doesn't. Each array is a cluster of individuals usually possessing some common characteristics and gravitating to a definite modal point in their variation. Therefore, the biological classification is simultaneously a man-made system of pigeonholes designed for the pragmatic purpose of recording observations in a convenient manner and an acknowledgement of the fact of organic discontinuity. It just so happens that our pigeonholes actually work, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. And it's especially amazing given that evolution is supposed to gradually fade from one animal to another. Three, we're coming back to our precise. Either of two evolutionary mechanisms might account for the fact, species species selection or demographic processes acting independently of phenotype. Four, most barcode variation consists of synonymous codon changes. Not non-synonymous, interestingly enough, even though there are more non-synonymous than synonymous changes that could happen. Since the assumption of neutrality of mitochondrial synonymous codons was asserted, many exceptions in nuclear genes and prokaryotic systems have been found. That is, non-synonymous doesn't mean that it really is non-synonymous. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, it, um, pardon me, synonymous doesn't mean it's really synonymous. It, uh, it just means that for protein coating purposes, it probably is. But it turns out that in mitochondria, it is. New arguments are presented that synonymous codon changes in mitochondrial genes are neutral to a greater extent than nu nuclear genes. And experimentally, uh, none of these animals that they find have a different mitochondria appear to be particularly disadvantaged or advantaged. Extensive data on modern humans make our species a valuable model system for animal evolution as a whole. The mitochondrial variation within the modern human population is about average when compared to the extant populations of most animal species. So if we have data on, on 
humans and uh, let's say length of time, it's probably applicable to the animals as other animals as well. Now that point needs to be reinforced too, so we'll dig into the article a little deeper. Modern humans are a low average animal species in terms of the APD. The molecular clock as a heuristic marks 1% sequence divergence per million years, which is consistent with evidence for a clonal stage of human mitochondria between 100 thousand to two hundred thousand years ago and the 0 0.1 APD found in the modern human population that's in the barcode itself not in the entire mitochondria but in the barcode itself on the average there's one difference in 600 base pairs a conjunction of factors could bring about the same result so there's a number of different ways you can explain this uh, and there are complicated explanations. However, one should not, at f as a first impulse, seek a complex and multifaceted explanation for one of the clearest, most data-rich and general facts in all of evolution. He's basically saying Occam's razor applies. The simple hypothesis is that the same explanation found, offered for the sequence variation found among modern humans applies equally to the modern populations of essentially all other animal species. Namely, that the extent, extant population, no matter what its current size or similarity to, to fossils of any age, has expanded from mitochondrial uniformity within the last 200,000 years. In other words, they're all the same age, more or less. Similar neutral variation of humans and other animals implies that the extant populations of most animal species have, like modern humans, recently passed through mitochondrial uniformity. So everybody else is doing the same thing. Um, the average pairwise difference between the CO1 barcode in modern humans is 0.1%, that is, about average for the animal kingdom. However, the most extreme differences between individual humans approaches 1%. So the average difference is different from what you can find as a possibility. This difference is as great as many distinctions among neighboring species. Maybe neighboring species are all the same species, you suppose? Uh, modern humans are a single population. Darwin made this point with respect to visible phenotypes and it applies even more strongly when neutral variants are considered. And this is a quote from Darwin. <clears throat> Hereafter we shall be compelled to acknowledge that the only distinction between species and well-marked varieties is that the latter are known or believed to be connected at present day by intermediate grad gradations, whereas species were formerly thus connected. But not anymore. That's the Darwinian model. Modern human mitochondria and white chromosome originated from the conditions that imposed a single, uh, the ellipsis in front of it says, this evidence indicates that, so don't take him as absolute here. Um, uh, conditions that imposed a single sequence on these genetic elements between 100,000 and 200,000 years ago. Contemporary sequence data cannot tell whether mitochondrial and Y chromosome clonality occurred at the same time, that is consistent with the extreme bottleneck of a founding pair. Um, where have we heard the theory of a founding pair before? Um, or via sorting within a founding population of thousands that was stable for tens of thousands of years. And the reference argues that it could be actually uh, a population that stayed pipelined for a long time. Uh, but think about it. What it means is that this is indistinguishable from the, what, what you would expect from a, an Adam and Eve. Why do you think they call it mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam? They know the story. As Kuhn points out, unresolvable arguments tend towards rhetoric. I love that line. <laughs> Mitochondria drive many important processes of life. There is irony but also grandeur in this view. Does anybody remember <laughs> that phrase before? There is grandeur in this view that 
Precisely because they have no phenotype, synonymous codon variations in mitochondria reveal the structure of species and the mechanism of speciation. This vista of evolution is best seen from the passenger seat. Close the article. Um, now, this is found not only where I put the uh, article, which is the actual official article that was published, but BioArchive will take articles that are about to be officially published and put them up online for people to, uh, I guess, review and comment. And um, there's a guy by the name of Dratman who makes a comment on this. 100,000 uh, instead of 6,000 uh, years ago, man and the animals were created. Strange news indeed from the bio world later. Now that I have the Genesis jokes out of my system, I want to focus on the 10% that do not follow this baffling new rule. Key question, what makes those species different? This is important. I would agree. Are they more, less, or what? Um, and how much more and how much less? And is it statistically believable that they could be the same and it's just they had more uh, DNA mutations in their uh, cyclooxygenase 1 barcode? Well, <clears throat> so people who are looking at this have some knowledge of the general implications. But it gets more fun. Uh, Ken R.L. et al. in 1987 noted that uh, in mitochondrial DNA, human, uh, um, mitochondrial DNA from 147 people drawn from five geographic populations have been analyzed by reconstruction mapping. All of these mitochondrial DNA stem from one woman who is postulated to have lived about 200,000 years ago. Notice that it got moved to 100,000 years in another summary. All the, just, you know, half the distance to the goal that's a penalty. Uh, um, <clears throat> um, probably in Africa, all the populations examined except the African population have multiple origins implying that each area was colonized repeatedly. Um, okay. Now I was, the, the, the next question is how do they know that it was 100,000 or 200,000 or whatever number they're using? You'd like to know. Uh, I was unable to find anything establishing the molecular clock rate in the three articles cited in, in Stuckel and Thaler. And I don't know if you noticed, but when, it, when you're going through there, they actually had a re three references. One of them was to one of their own works. They've been doing this for a while. But it didn't really say how they knew it was 100,000. Um, the other two, one of them was to Linus Pauling's and Zucker Candle's original article. And the third one, didn't say how you knew how long it had been, how long ago it had been. Um, but under a, th under a section called tentative time scale, Rebecca Can tells you how she knows. Um, at all, I should say. A time scale can be affixed to the tree in figure three by assuming that mitochondrial DNA sequence divergence accumulates at a constant rate in humans. One way of estimating this rate is to consider the extent of differentiating within clusters specific to New Guinea, table two, see also references 23 and 30, Australia, uh, 30, and the New World, 31. People colonized these regions relatively recently, minimum of 30,000 years ago for New Guinea, 40,000 years ago for Australia, and 12,000 years ago for the New World. As you may know, there's some controversy over that last figure now. <coughs> These times enable us to calculate that the mean rate of mitochondrial DNA divergence within humans lies between 2 and 4 percent per million years. A detailed account of this calculation appears elsewhere, and that's reference 30. Um, this rate is similar to previous estimates from animals as disparate as apes, monkeys, horses, rhinoceroses, mice, bats, uh, rats, birds, and fishes. We therefore consider the above estimate of 2 to 4 percent to be reasonable for humans, although additional comparative work is needed to attain a more exact calibration. So how, well, it's done on the basis of um, the standard geological time scale and evolutionary theory. And um, 
It'll be interesting to see whether the New World estimate is actually lower than the estimate for New Guinea. Um, I would, s uh, uh, the change in the New World is less than the change in New Guinea. I would suspect so. But uh, one could go through that and see whether their estimates actually work. But remember, they're all dependent on really 40,000 for New Guinea. If it hasn't been 40,000 for New Guinea, then uh, let's say it's been 4,000, then we're, then we're 10 times too high. Right? Okay. The common ancestor of all surviving mitochondrial DNA types existed 140,000 to 290,000 years ago. Notice that now um, 200,000 is a midpoint estimate by that rationale. Okay. Now, in 1997, Parsons, who happens to be a forensic DNA specialist, that is, you bring him remains of something that's a human, maybe, and he'll tell you, first of all, it's, it's a human and not a dog, and secondly, that this could be Tsar Nicholas II. That's his job. A high observed substitution rate in the human mitochondrial DNA control region. He needs to know how fast do these things mutate. And you can, I, originally when I sent out the email, I put a, an address. What I found out is that every time you do that, the address corrupts immediately. Uh, the address is a long one. And what you really should do is go put the high observed substitution rate into Google Scholar. It will pop you up one article. It will have a link to it. You go there and it will work for that one time. But I can't give you an actual link. Okay. But it's there. And it was there some years ago. A rate, uh, the rate and a pattern of sequence substitutions in mitochondrial DNA control region, uh, or CR, which is the, I think the one up in here, um, is of central importance to studies of human evolution and to forensic identity testing. Here we, we report a direct measurement of the intergenerational substitution rate in human CR. We compare DNA sequences of two CR hypervariable segments from close maternal relatives from 134 independent mtDNA lineages spanning 327 generational events. So this is a pretty good um, series. Ten substitutions were observed resulting in an empirical rate of 1 to 33 generations or 2.5 sites per million years. 2.5 per site per million years. That's 200 percent per million years. Okay. This is roughly 20-fold higher than estimates derived from phylogenetics analyses. This disparity cannot be accounted for simply by substitutions at mutational hotspots, suggesting additional factors that produce the discrepancy between very near-term and long-term apparent rates of sequence divergence. The data also indicate that extremely rapid segregation of CR sequence variants between generations is common in humans with a very small mitochondrial DNA bottleneck. These studies have implications for forensic applications and, s and studies of human evolution. He, this is important because he's doing this stuff. But it also has implications for human evolution. And a little further down in the article, using our empirical rate to calibrate the mitochondrial DNA molecular clock would result in an age of the mitochondrial DNA uh, most recent common ancestor, that's mitochondrial Eve, of only about 6,500 years ago. Clearly incompatible with the known age of modern humans. Well, yeah, there are some fringe people who believe that, I guess. While our results, now think about this, it's incompatible with standard evolutionary theory, right? But while our results are at odds with those of phylogenetic studies, they are in excellent agreement with a recent report that also directly measured the CR substitution rate. Somebody else got the same answer they did. 
This is reproducible. If you measure it in actual people as opposed to evolutionary theory. And a little further on down the line in 2005, Ho SYW et al. wrote, and again the article is on uh, line, a number of recent studies of mitochondrial DNA extracted from subfossils and from detailed human pedigrees have reported exceptionally high estimates of mutation rate. Analysis of the mitochondrial control region, for example, have yielded mutation rates as high as 32 to 260% per million years in humans. Parsons et al. 1997, you know that one. Also Sigador et al., also Howell et al., and 95% per million years in Adelie penguins. Uh, Lambert et al., 2002. So there's a whole bunch of them there that, that I'll give you the same answer. And None are cited that give you a different answer if you do it with the moderns. These estimates of the mutation rate in the control region vastly exceed the traditionally recognized substitution rate of 1% per million years for protein-coded mitochondrial DNA. I should have marked that because this is actually part of the same paragraph. This is the next line, I mean the next sentence. Okay, which was originally derived from studies of various metazoan groups. Brown, George, and Wilson, 1979, has been supported by a number of comparable estimates from subsequent studies. So I don't know whether these the people previously used these uh, articles, but they could have. And this is the way you usually get it. Okay? And they give Randy, Fleischer, McIntosh, and Tarr, 1998. So they're, they've been around for a while, too. Okay? And Gibbons and all, in, uh, and Gibbons, some of you may recognize that name as a um, reporter for, I think it is Nature, uh, Science? Science. Um, cap, uh, calibrating the Mitochondrial Clock, Science 279. And this one again is online. Uh, regardless of the cause, evolutionists are most concerned about the effect of a faster mutation rate. For example, researchers have calculated that mitochondrial Eve, the woman whose mitochondrial DNA is ancestral to that, and all living people lived 100,000 to 200,000 years ago in Africa. Using the new clock, she would be a mere 6,000 years old. Hmm. 6,000. I've heard that number somewhere before. Um, no one thinks that's the case. <coughs> well, almost no one. But at what point should models switch from one mitochondrial DNA time zone to the other? In other words, we have two different rates, one for the present and one for the past. You see, the present is not the key to the past if you're a good evolutionist, right? I mean, isn't that what they say? And. Mitochondrial DNA studies now date the peopling of the Americas at 34,000 years ago. Remember, it's 12,000 by carbon-14. Even though the oldest non-controversial archaeological sites are 12,500 years old. Recalibrating the mitochondrial DNA clock would narrow the difference. It might solve some other problems we have. You don't suppose? Hmm. But not everyone is ready to redate evolutionary history on the basis of a few studies of mutation rates in living people. This is all a fuss about nothing, said Oxford University geneticist Martin Richards, who thinks that the fast rate, it's really there, but it only reached back hundreds of years at most, see? Don't you love it? That, however, is squarely within the time frame of forensics cases. So, if you're doing evolutionary theory, you use the one. If, you use, if you're doing forensics, um, uh, then you use the other one. Heteroplasmy isn't always a complicating factor in such analyses. When it exists in more than one family member, the confidence in the identification gets stronger, as in the case of the Tsar, uh, who uh, this guy did. But otherwise, it could let a criminal off the hook if his mitochondrial DNA differed by one nucleotide from a crime scene, crime scene sample. Therefore, Parsons and Holland in their work identifying 220 soldiers' remains from World War II to the present, see, 
they actually have to use this stuff, have, now have new guidelines adopted by the FBI as well to account for a faster mutation rate when a missing soldiers or criminal suspects and mitochondrial DNA comes up with a single difference from that of a relative or, a or at a crime scene, the scientists no longer call it a mismatch. Instead, the results are considered inconclusive. And for now, so are some of the evolutionary results gained by using the mitochondrial DNA clock. How's that for a polite way of saying, be careful with your assumptions? That's the end of that. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, those of you who've been around long enough will remember that viruses have the same problem, appearing to be recent while being well adapted to their respective hosts, who supposedly have a long evolutionary history and supposedly they went with their hosts during that time. So, you know, they had to split millions of years ago, but they look like they're only thousands of years different or maybe even hundreds of years different. If you want the evidence, there's uh, the, uh, the presentations that I made, uh, I think in 1916, on YouTube. And finally, I would be remiss if I did not mention that John Sanford has got in on the act. Uh, 2008, he talks about the Eve mitochondrial consensus sequence. He says that we actually know what, within one or two amino acids, we know what uh, Eve's mitochondrial sequence was. It's that good. And um, anyway, uh, you can look that up. Uh, it's well worth a read, but uh, we've obviously run out of time to go through it in any detail. To summarize, most species go back some 100 to 200,000 years ago according to mitochondrial barcodes, according to published literature. Intermediates are rarely found and in the case of bears may be the same species. After all, they interbreed, so does not that make them the same species? Humans are included in this group. When human DNA changes are calibrated against history, as opposed to evolutionary theory, the age range shrinks to 6,000 years. Eh, 4,000, 8,000, somewhere in there. That would mean that the vast majority of species go back some 4,000 to 8,000 years. The easiest explanation is that there was some kind of extinction or bottleneck or creation maybe at this time. Conventional scientists do not recognize any of these kinds of events at this time. Perhaps they should. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Okay, I have a comment back here, uh, Jack Stout. Yeah, and then uh, we'll get you, and then uh, Ariel. I'm not sure whether this is a relevant question, but uh, since a lot of this is based on cytochrome oxidase, yes. Uh, what about the anaerobic organisms? Well, okay, it doesn't cover bacteria because they don't have mitochondria. Is, uh, I, I'm aware of that. Of course, well, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, but I don't know of any anaerobic animals. I don't even know of any anaerobic plants. Mm -hmm. I know of plants that can, well, well I, was I, I think fungi still I, need I, oxygen. I was wondering if there's anything parallel in the anaerobic bacteria. Uh, well, see, without mitochondria, there wouldn't be. This is all animals and all organisms that have mitochondria are susceptible to this kind of analysis. I would imagine that uh, you could do the same analysis, by the way, if you did chloroplasts, which have their own DNA also. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just a matter of, of doing it. The nice thing about mitochondrial barcodes as opposed to the rest of mitochondria is that you have this huge database because people have kind of used this one little piece as a key. 
Yeah, I, I guess I was really focusing on is there anything that could be done similarly in the bacteria, particularly the, uh, yeah, the bacteria without, uh, without uh, mitochondria, but many of the aerobic bacteria have very similar pathways. Well, I would imagine that all you'd have to do is find an enzyme that every animal needs, and as a matter of fact, there is one. It's the ATP um, turbine. And uh, you probably could do that for every organism under the sun. And a few of them that are not under the sun. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I just had a question, I think, last week and the week before you kind of alluded to looking forward to uh, tracing mitochondrial DNA back to three women or something, and, and then you made some allusion to maybe the descendants from the Ark. Is there, is there anything more that you can say about that? Um, yeah, I, but as I put this thing together, I realized that I couldn't cram that in at the end. Uh, I mean, we're already uh, you know, pushing 50 minutes, and, and, and that means that uh, Actually, we're, we're beyond uh, 50 minutes right now. Uh, and uh, I didn't want to keep it going for that long. But yes, there is an article. Uh, unfortunately, um, it, what, I wish that, what I wish that we as creationists could do is to say, and, and I know it glazes the eyes and all that stuff, but it's what you really have to do if you're going to do it right. And that is to say, here is the database that I looked at. Here is the program I used. Uh, here's what it does. You can make up your own program if you want to. And you can run this on the database. In other words, to try to make it so that I am as transparent as possible. That you don't have to take anything as you know, I'm the PhD and I know. Um, and so they have, uh, they have a nice little diagram with some scattered stuff on it. But I'm, uh, I may get into this later on, the problem that we have because the Y chromosomes, uh, suddenly you find out that they go back to about uh, less than 10,000 years and then they come down to a point two. And then they go on beyond that. Uh, the truth of the matter is we don't have DNA from Y chromosomes older than Otzi, the guy that fell into the, uh, the ice man, you know? Uh, that's the oldest. Uh, that's the oldest Y chromosome we have, and my understanding is has been done. Um, and he's in a line that is no longer extant for what it's worth. Uh, apparently, all his brothers died without having uh, sons, as well, and it, or somewhere along the line that that, that particular line has dropped out. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, the, the thing about this stuff here is it's reproducible and probably wouldn't take all that much to make it work. Um, I mean, uh, you could, you probably, depending on how much background knowledge you had, have to burn uh, somewhere between uh, a couple of days and three months of time to actually reproduce it. But it, it, the data is public knowledge. You could do it yourself. And that's one of the, I don't like arguments that are, that require a specific thing to be there. I mean, there's, for example, Guadalupe woman that uh, was displayed in the British Museum and then was taken down and is 
supposedly in 28 million year old limestone, you know, which has some very interesting implications if it's true. But like if, if somebody has the wrong date or if somebody has the wrong uh, species, then all of a sudden the argument collapses because there's only one data point in a sense. This stuff, there's data points all over and you can get more if you want to and it's relatively cheap and you can analyze the data that's there and that is time intensive but not particularly money intensive if you've got a computer that can h hook up to the internet. So I like this stuff even better because it's reproducible and that's the essence of science. Yes. Yeah. Uh, excellent presentation. I uh, hope this generates a lot of further study uh, because the case seems to be fairly clear, but it might uh, profit a little more authentication. I uh, would point out uh, that beyond this data, of course, you know, they're, they're dealing with equivocal data as far as, uh, say, 100,000, 200,000 years of concern. And uh, one can also challenge the 6,000-year data. It's, you know, it was done with mitochondrial DNA when it came out. You may recall it's first. But um, what I want to uh, simply state there, there are other factors that also seem to indicate that man has not been around here that long. Including uh, where are all the graves? Exactly. Why are why are why is ancient man so rare compared to what you'd expect over say uh, two hundred thousand years? Uh, we're doubling population every fifty years. Uh, you know, it's kind of. And uh, well, the theory, of course, is that we couldn't figure out how to double our population until suddenly about uh, six six thousand years six thousand ten thousand years 10, ago ten thousand years ago, 10, years ago. Years ago. Sudden, ooh, uh, that's how you do it <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, no there's a major gap there in the rate of uh, human reproduction uh, as soon as you get to a few thousand years uh, in terms of what was left around but also we can say the uh, why what was man doing for the first uh, 196,000 years, um, no writing, is that old? Um, and what about uh, uh, buildings, uh, pyramids, uh, aqueducts, all this stuff is, uh, indicates fairly recent and, and points to a uh, data that tends to support the, the 6,000 year uh, figure here for uh, mitochondrial DNA. Yeah. Right. Yeah. By the way, I, you may remember a few uh, uh, months ago we had Irv Taylor on and he was going to do some tree ring stuff, doing a test. I haven't heard anything from that uh, since, so um, I probably need to bug him one of these days and, and ask him how far along he's gotten and if I can do anything to help him out. Uh, uh, because I think that uh, I think that there are a whole bunch of things that one of them in isolation doesn't make that much difference but you put one next to the other next to the other well this is basically what this is is two parts all the animals came out uh, you know out of some kind of probably population bottleneck maybe uh, some kind of uh, evolutionary thing but some kind of something uh, about 10 to, or 120 to 100,000 mm -hmm. years ago humans are an excellent example and humans if you use historical as opposed to evolutionary numbers come out pretty close to uh, 6,000 years ago well that means that all the other ones get moved down to 6,000 now 4,000, 8,000, nobody's going to argue mm -hmm. with that. So maybe there was a bottleneck. Oh, let's say 4,300, 4,500 years ago. Um, uh, some kind of massive flooding. I mean, there's legends of that, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And it would be interesting to see if Y chromosomes did the same thing. Because you could at attack this from two different angles. Yes. Uh, uh, just, uh, I realize you were commenting on this, but the difference between the bottleneck called the flood or then creation, there's a difference of 1,500 years, which percentage-wise is significant. Now, do we know if any of the Bible scholars and historians are coming up with a better calculation? I mean, there was the drama around the uh, British um, historian who came up and reworked out all the dates for Joseph and so on. But I mean, uh, uh, is there any progress on dating the biblical record to accurate dates? You're, you're referring to Roll, I yeah. assume? Yeah. Um, uh, well, if you, if you do Roll, and you put the Sixth Dynasty as ending um, at the Exodus, which is not an unreasonable uh, assumption if you're doing if you're redoing Egyptian history, um, then you have some kind of minor compression you have to do between dynasties one and six. Um, at which point is it a dynasty two three? Is it dynasty three four? I don't know. Um, uh, but if you, if you do some kind of compression of that kind, then suddenly uh, you can fit all this into pretty standard uh, treatment of the text of the Old Testament. And even Masoretic text uh, of the uh, pre-Abrahamic dates. Um, of course, then you have to deal with history, but you have to realize that history was made by people who thought Genesis was all wet, and we needed to start Egyptian history and more in line with evolutionary theory, that Sir Flinders Petrie being the most prominent among them. And they started out with Mina being 6,000 years uh, BC, which basically everybody in the field knows is off by around 3,000 years. Is it 3,100 BC? Is it 2,800 BC? Not sure. Um, but, um, so 2300 BC becomes a possible compression point. So, uh, if, uh, the, the point of it is, if we got to 2800, if we got to 3500 for Mesopotamian civilization, there's a flood then. It's in the record and it says where, you know, where it belongs in that particular scheme. Pre-flood is open to anybody's interpretation, and flood would basically take the entire geologic column with it. Um, and if carbon-14 dating holds that all of this stuff is buried at the same time, and it was buried within the last, I mean, at that, you know, if, if somehow we wound up with 50,000 years was the correct answer, a hundred thousand years. The scientific, the standard scientific answer would be balderdash, poppycock, would be de defunct. And people don't realize the sea shift that would take place then and now all of a sudden you would have to start asking really serious questions as to how far you can rely on the biblical record. Maybe a lot more than we thought. Um, and uh, I mean, you have to keep that big picture there. And the people who are doing this, you, you saw the joke, 100,000 years, I'll take that. You know, um, 100,000 years for every single species out there. That's just bizarre, if you think about it. Yes. I can't help but speak up when it comes to the subject of chronology. <laughs> it's been my lifelong interest. I was away on vacation the last four or five weeks. That's why you haven't seen me. 
If you've seen someone that looks like me, it's not me. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, during that time, about two weeks ago, I did a computer search on biblical chronology mm -hmm. to see mm -hmm. if there's any new materials. Appreciate I came across that. a book that's been reviewed only once in academic literature, a book by Lee Casperson. Casperson. And it's called Patterns of Biblical Chronology, and it's published by uh, Thomas Nelson, so it's a very good publisher. Um, it's a weighty tome, 600 and some pages. I just got it this week, and I've been reading it all week. And um, he's taking a overall conservative view for the time of Joseph and to the, you know, to the Exodus. He has a 15th century Exodus instead of the 1445 that's in the SDA Bible commentary, it's the 1440, um, which he find- Five find, years among friends is nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he fine tunes the Exodus date and the date for Solomon using jubilees. Is he firmly believes that Solomon began work on the temple on a jubilee uh, year. So now that's debatable. I haven't yeah, seen many yeah. scholars sticking their neck out saying that much. But once he gets 1440, then he says there are two chronologies that go back to Abraham. There's the Genesis chronology and the Exodus. He calls them two different separate chronologies. The Genesis model and the Exodus model, he calls them. Uh, Genesis model is 400 years that was promised to Abraham that his seed would be wandering around for 400 years. The Exodus model is 430 years. That's the one that we follow and it's in the SDA Bible commentary. And the question is, is it a 230, uh, 215 plus 215? Right. There's or the, is it uh, 430 for the whole thing? Yeah. Um, he's the first scholar I've found that suggests the 400 years going back to Abraham in Genesis 15 is the more accurate of the two. And he has quite a bit of um, logic. He uses jubilees and he uses all kinds of things on that. He also does something I've done and I, I thought I was a, a lone wolf in the wilderness <laughs> on this. Uh, looking at dendrochronology as a possibility to uh, identify biblical famines. And so he lines up the seven year famine of Joseph with the years 1627 to 1620 BC. And Jacob and his family came down in the third year of the famine, uh, came down to Egypt, and he nails that down to 1625 BC. But he looks anew at the 400 year model from Genesis 15 and says we can arrive at that quite easily. Now independently this spring I had arrived at the same date using the same logic, but I won't bore you with any more details other than at least now there's two human beings on planet Earth that we know about, <laughs> myself and Lee yeah. Casperson. It's, that land at the same spot. Yeah, it's an interesting discussion. Yeah. The thing to keep in mind is the overall picture. You have to. If you yeah. turn out to be correct on that, or if the people who put 430 years in, is in, uh, in Egypt right. turn out to be correct, or the people who put 215 in Canaan and 215 in Egypt turn out to be correct, it's any one of those is way less than the standard models for either history Absolutely. or um, or geology. Exactly. And the thing to keep in mind is that there's plenty of time to squabble over those kinds of details after we've settled the main point, which is it wasn't uh, six million years for humans to arrive. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, looks like we've finished the comments, so um, come back next week and we'll talk about the alien octopi.